Welcome everyone, my name is Radi Stern from the Weizmann Institute and uh, this is Nathaniel Lindner from the Technion. And together we are supposed to uh, co-direct this uh, school on frontiers of quantum science. I cannot say I uh, think of myself as someone who was born to be a school principal, but Nathaniel I'm sure uh, does. Uh, so, uh, we're going to start with an introductory lecture which is supposed to give you a, an overview of what's, uh, what to expect uh, to happen in this week. Now, the first question, of course, uh, we should answer is uh, who cares about a uh, uh, quantum? So, uh, this is uh, taken from yesterday's edition of Israel Ayom. Uh, and it says uh, that there's a breakthrough on quantum computation. And as I told uh, our uh, guests from board, We'll explain that later. Uh, that newspaper, as you know, uh, in the last uh, so many years, has had only one focus of attention and interest. <laughs> and now maybe it's expanding its uh, horizon. Uh, the reason, by the way, why this, why Israel Ayom decided to talk about quantum physics uh, uh, will be discussed in, in talks. Uh, this week, and we're going to have two of the co-authors of the paper that uh, is advertised there. Now, uh, uh, so, so I hope you're convinced that uh, quantum is interesting. Now, why do we need a school? So, we, we thought we need a school for three reasons. First is uh, we need to get uh, up to date about many developments that are happening, that, that, that happen uh, very rapidly, in, in some, in, in basically in all, all uh, sides of uh, quantum science and technology. So we'd like to cover some facets of this field and get you up to date. Uh, we thought we should also emphasize the interrelations between the different facets that we will cover. And we also thought that it would be nice to spend a relaxing week in the Galilee. It's a nice place, as you probably have noticed. Now, we try to plan the school uh, focusing on these three pillars, and we failed. We had to give up one. Uh, so that's not going to happen. Now, uh, what are the facets we're going to cover? There, there will be three parts, basically, to, the, to this uh, school. Uh, the first will be realizations of quantum devices. Mostly we will talk about qubits, but uh, also a little bit about sensors. The second will be... Uh, concepts of quantum information theory and how eventually, in hopefully the reasonably near future, they will be put to use in a quantum computer. Uh, so this will be a more theoretical part. And the third uh, uh, facet will be uh, how uh, our understanding of quantum many-body systems, mostly in the context of condensed matter physics, but not necessarily, how are they affected by tools which are developed uh, for, for quantum information theory. And, and we're going to, in, in, in this coming, whatever, 25 or, or 35 minutes, uh, we're going to go basically speaker by speaker and tell you a little bit about uh, what they're doing, or, or what they will cover. Uh, but before doing that, I'll, I'll say a few words, you know, just about the language. Probably many of you know this, and it's not going to be deep, but, uh, but still, just to introduce some basic concepts. So, you know, a qubit, as you can read in Israel Ayom, uh, it's a two-level system, it's like a bit, it has a, a two states, zero and one, but unlike uh, the, the, the classical bit, it can be in a superposition of zero and one, uh, with uh, these uh, uh, three factors, alpha and beta, uh, and uh, uh, alpha and beta take uh, continuous values, and, and that uh, basically uh, makes a, a, a departure from the, the, the digital concept of uh, classical computers. Now, since alpha and beta are two complex numbers, uh, but, uh, but uh, in fact only two of them are significant, we can describe the state of, of the qubit on the block sphere. Now, we need uh, to know if we are to... Uh, if, if, if we are uh, uh, to use... If we, if we are to have a, a qubit, we need to know how to initialize it to put in, in some initial state. We need to know how to apply unitary transformation that will take from one state to another. 
we need to read its uh, final state, and we need to be able to couple it to other qubits. Uh, now, the, the basic experiment that you see when you want to, that, that you look at when you want to uh, convince yourself that the qubit you uh, created with lots of uh, uh, blood, sweat, and tears uh, is in fact functioning, uh, you, you do that by, by looking at trivial oscillations, which are a, an indication for the qubit being in a super, or being able to be in a coherent superposition of, uh, of two states. Now, uh, uh, once you have a functioning uh, qubit, which is not easy, you want to have more than one, and you want to couple them to one another, and you want, so you have to have, you want to have a, a gate which involve two qubits, and uh, the most basic one is this uh, uh, T0 gate, uh, which uh, exemplifies very nicely the, the, uh, the quantum aspect of the two uh, qubit gate. Uh, it, uh, it has a, a tooth uh, table uh, which is classical, you know, if the first bit is zero, uh, it doesn't do anything between the input and the output, and if the first bit is one, it flips the second bit. Uh, this is why it's called controlled knot. Uh, the nice uh, quantum aspect is that, is that if the first bit is at a zero plus one uh, superposition, then even though the initial state is the product state, zero plus one multiplied by zero, the output will already be uh, an entangled state. So this two uh, uh, qubit gate is a, a producer of entanglement, and that's an aspect that will uh, 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 take place here. The, my, my automatic uh, slide move is as well. Anyway. Uh, so, so, so once, once you, you have a, a single qubit that does what, the, what I said before, and you have a, a two qubit gate that uh, can entangle your state, you want to go on and build a, a quantum circuit, which uh, probably will look much more complicated than this. Now, if it's so simple, why, why uh, isn't it already done? Because many things can go wrong. Uh, you, your single qubit, uh, which you produced uh, in a superposition of of two of the two poles of the block still may decay just by some kind of a golden rule mechanism, just like the uh, hydrogen atom decays from the excited state to the ground state, it may decay, uh, and that defines a, a time scale T1 after which your qubit doesn't work. Even if it doesn't decay, it may uh, the relative phase between the zero and the one may be defaced because of uh, uh, the two components zero and one. Uh, accumulating an uncertain phase, and that defines another time scale, uh, typically shorter, T2, after which your qubit doesn't go. Uh, now, once you have many qubits, things, of course, get, get exponentially more complicated. In particular, the errors that are happening on different qubits may be correlated, uh, your control of the coupling may be uh, tricky, and so on and so forth. Many things can go wrong. Now, uh, so, so, uh, so this is uh, what I wanted to say about the very basic language that we're going to use. Now, uh, what, I, what I'm going to do now is to, to start just going over uh, the, the contents of the various uh, presentations that we will hear, the various mini courses that we will hear. And the first one will be about uh, uh, how to realize uh, qubits. Um, there will be matter-based qubits, and there will be also uh, photons-based qubits. Let me say, start with the matter-based qubits. Um, it turns out uh, one way to start is, is, to, think, is to, to get an inspiration from the periodic table. So, uh, and there are many periodic tables. Uh, the first one is the periodic table of elements. Uh, you know, the Mendeleev one. And uh, Roy Ozeri, who was talking about the uh, uh, peptides and Pedro Murchan, will talk about the uh, superconducting qubits. They will, take, they will pick the, the element that they need and do with it the thing that which I will explain in a minute. Uh, the second uh, uh, table of element, uh, 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 second periodic table is what's known as the periodic table of topological insulators. And uh, Jason Arishia with the first talk. Uh, and Charlie Marcos with the second talk will pick one of the symmetry classes that compose this uh, uh, table, uh, class D, if you are curious, uh, and uh, will try to make a qubit out of it. The third uh, uh, periodic table is less well known. It's the periodic table of beer styles, uh, and that we will do in the evenings. And uh, uh, since we did not see any uh, lecturer who is really qualified for this, 
Netanel and I will take uh, care of that also. Um, so, so now, uh, there will be four types, I think, of uh, uh, qubit realizations. The first one will be on uh, trapped ions. Uh, it will be made of trapped ions, and uh, we'll we'll talk about that on Tuesday. Uh, I think that you will get here later in the evening, uh, later today, and I see you already. Um, basically, this is based on, on property, uh, on the first property you uh, learn about when you learn quantum uh, mechanics, and this is the, uh, the fact that the energy spectrum is, is discrete, is quantized, uh, and, and you're going to use two of the states of the atom of the ion as your two-level system. Uh, you need to, to pick the right atom, you need to, buy, uh, to pick the right energy level. Uh, energy levels, uh, you need to know how to trap the ion, how to, to hold it fixed for a long time. Uh, and you need to know how to couple different ions, how to uh, uh, apply a unitary transformation on them, and how to measure them at the end. Now we will uh, explain all this. Uh, I should say, um, you see that here, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's very challenging. As you can tell, uh, as you can see here, this, this lab is about, you know, give or take about my size, uh, and it has a few tens of qubits. This is about the size of my cell phone, which is now in my pocket, and it has uh, about 10 to the 12 classical bits. So, so there's still a matter of, each, uh, of size uh, which we need to sort out. Uh, but anyway, we'll hear about that. The second type of uh, qubits that we'll talk about will be a superconducting qubit. And that, that's the one that, uh, uh, that's the type that uh, uh, made the, the news uh, yesterday. Uh, again, the, the size is pretty uh, large uh, for a few tens of qubits. Uh, again, the cell phone has a little bit more. Uh, now, it turns out, and, and we'll hear about that from Petra Mushan uh, 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 on Thursday and Friday towards the end of the week. Uh, it turns out that uh, the, uh, a superconducting circuit, despite being made of a huge number of atoms has a discrete spectrum and, and, and one that we can control. Uh, it has a nice feature that if you take a, a superconducting circuit and you put it somewhere, it doesn't go anywhere. You don't need to trap it, unlike an ion. Uh, but it has the bad, uh, uh, the bad side that uh, it couples to, you know, it's a big thing. It couples to many, many degrees of freedom, to many phonons, to many uh, third degrees of freedom, to many, uh, to, very, to, to all kinds of solid state environments. Uh, and so you get more and more sources of uh, uh, noise of, and of decoding. Uh, we'll hear from, from uh, Pedram how, how he and uh, his, his colleagues at uh, IBM and his competitors, uh, excuse me, Google, and his competitors at IBM, uh, 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 how they are using coupling between superconducting qubits, how they, how they realize single uh, qubits, how they induce coupling, and uh, uh, what can they do at the moment. Uh, I have to warn you. There's uh, homework to be expected for this part. In fact, uh, we were thinking of maybe uh, giving it to you, sending it to you on email uh, last night, but we preferred you first to uh, go on the bus and then, uh, and then tell you the, what's expected. Uh, the, the third type of uh, qubits is in, is in fact the one we will start from, uh, and these are the topological qubits. Um, and uh, uh, they will be covered by, by uh, Charlie Marcus and by Jason and Shia, in fact, in opposite order. Uh, oh, oh, well, Jason, Jason will be the first and the last on Sunday and Thursday. Charlie will talk today. Uh, and, and, and that uh, idea is kind of orthogonal to all others. Uh, and it will be based on the physics of topological phases of matter in particular. Uh, on topological superconductivity, as I said, extracted from this periodic uh, table of topological instruments. And uh, I assume many of you don't know what that is, don't worry. Um, now, it has a, a unique way to combat noise and decoherence, and the way it does it is by storing the information in a non-local way, meaning if you want to measure the state of your qubit, you have uh, to have a non-local measurement. Uh, and your environment uh, uh, cannot do that because it, it acts locally on your uh, uh, cube. Uh, by the, at the end of the day, that's supposed uh, to be uh, or to result in the decoherence in, in, to, 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 to result in a very special dependence of the decoherence time on temperature. 
So usually for, for various uh, sources of decoherence that you can imagine in superconducting qubits, in theft ions, in, in almost everywhere, the decoherence time uh, goes like one over the temperature to some power. So it's a power law of temperature. No, the lower the temperature is, of course, the decoherence time gets longer, but, uh, but there's a power law. For topological qubits, it's supposed to be uh, an, uh, uh, an exponential dependence, so the decoherence time will go like an exponent of delta over t, or maybe delta over t to some power, and it doesn't matter what delta is, but, but as a function of temperature, you see this dependence gives us a, you know, it's very fast, uh, uh, goes up very, very quickly. So, so we would expect very long uh, decoherence time. Now, we will hear from Jason and, and Charlie uh, how to build a topological system uh, from, from basically ingredients you can uh, buy in your uh, neighborhood uh, hardware store, uh, and uh, how to apply topologically protected quantum logic. Now, uh, just as uh, all the other types of uh, uh, qubits, we will also hear about lots of uh, challenges and difficulties uh, along the way. So that's the end of the uh, list of meta-based qubits, and for the Next part of the presentation, Nathaniel will take over. Okay, thank you, uh, Adi. Um, and uh, so we're continuing on to the uh, more tonics-based realization. So what are these? Um, so in these type of realizations, we actually try to store uh, quantum information uh, in quantum states of light, photon and also manipulate them as quantum state of light. Um, now, this, this approach has a very big advantage in that photons, as you might know, are very weakly interacting particles. Uh, and, and given the proper environment, they would also interact very weakly with their environment. Uh, and that basically uh, implies that their decoherence rate, the decoherence rate of, of photonic qubits, could be, uh, become very, very small if you compare them to decoherence rates, say, of, of matter-based qubits. Of course, this comes at a price, uh, and, and the price is that it's very hard to get photons to interact in order to apply uh, entangling gates, for example, right? In order to apply a gate that, that produces an entangled state from two product states, you actually have to have interactions between the qubits. And, and that's very hard to do for photons. Uh, so. Terry, Terry Rudolph, will tell us how to uh, actually do this, uh, how to process quantum information, uh, um, starting actually with, with single photons, uh, and then actually using kind of simple linear optics and, and simple uh, photon uh, detectors uh, to actually build up uh, interesting quantum states of light and, and actually processing quantum information. Again, another warning here is that you guys are, again, uh, might expect homeworks uh, in that, in that uh, lecture. So another, another uh, important realization, although it's not directly a realization of quantum computing, uh, is the realization of quantum sensors. So what, what do we mean by quantum sensors? So a quantum sensor would be basically a, a measurement device which is based on, on a, a, a kind of a quantum system. Suppose a, it could be a spin qubit, a trapped ion, a flux qubit, a flux superconducting qubit, uh, it could be an atomic defect in solid, like a, what we call a nitrogen vacancy center in diamond. And uh, these uh, quantum systems, using quantum systems, we uh, try to get high precision, high sensitivity, and also high uh, resolution measurements, say, of very weak magnetic fields uh, um, in all kinds of environments. Now, uh, Christian Degen uh, uh, will tell us, uh, basically, how to uh, optimize uh, these, uh, the protocols for uh, doing these uh, quantum uh, sensing or sensing with these uh, quantum detectors, uh, given the fact that uh, we have to also uh, take into account decoherence and the interaction of these detectors with the environment. In particular, Christian will also show, you, show us how to uh, use entanglement, basically to overcome what we call the short noise limit, to overcome the statistical noise coming from a finite number of repetitions of the measurement. We'll show you that using entanglement, we can actually increase uh, the sensitivity of the measurement uh, and, and use less measurements in order to achieve the same thing. Uh, so this will be kind of a, the, the kind of more uh, realization or experimental uh, part of the, of the school. 
And now I want to move on to, to the more theoretical parts of the school, the kind of the part which is discussed concept from quantum information theory and, and the theory of quantum computation. Um, and first, the first question that comes up in mind, okay, so, so suppose we can build this type of device, what can it actually do? Maybe the most basic question is, okay, so what, the, what is a quantum circuit? A quantum circuit is, is something that applies a unitary transformation you know, in a whole bunch of qubits. What types of uh, unitary transformation can we actually apply? Can we actually apply any unitary transformation? And how many, uh, how many gates or how many logical cycles will we need uh, to actually apply an arbitrary, uh, uh, arbitrary unitary circuit? So this kind of uh, question falls into the uh, uh, theorem by Solveig Kitai, which gives, a, gives us a bound on the number of gates we need to apply any unitary transformation. And, and Stephen Jordan will discuss this on Tuesday and on Wednesday. Um, you'll also discuss what's a universal, gate of set, uh, universal set of gates which gates do we actually need? What's the minimal set of gates we actually need to, to apply any unitary transformation? And then once uh, uh, you accept that, you can ask, okay, but what, what kind of actually useful uh, computational problems can we do with this uh, device? Right? What, what, what can it do well, which is more powerful than a regular classical computer? Um, and, and Steve will discuss that and, and kind of different computational classes and where the quantum computational class fits at. Uh, between the, the known uh, kind of classical com computational uh, classes or complex complexity classes. Uh, and then another interesting question for physicists is to ask whether a quantum computer is actually able to simulate quantum dynamics or dynamics of, an, or or of complex quantum computer. So all these topics will be discussed by Stefan on uh, Tuesday and Wednesday. Now the next topic which is very, very crucial for, for quantum uh, computation is to actually combat this decoherence and noise that Adi discussed before. And, you know, we, most of us can think uh, or know how to correct errors in, in a classical uh, device. For example, you can think about the majority vote, uh, where if you are afraid that you're, you might have bit flips in, in your processor, so if zero is flip to one and vice versa, you might want to just encode, uh, you know, the zero in one state in, in a bunch of more bits and then do a majority vote, which would tell you, okay, uh, actually, that second bit has flipped, uh, and really the state here should be zero. Okay. So that there is a lower probability uh, for flipping more than one bit. Uh, and then this majority vote kind of helps us correct the error uh, that was incurred. So we could do the same thing in a quantum computer. We could, uh, you know, we're worried about flipping the state of the qubit from zero to one. We could encode in, in a, a one qubit say the zero state in, in, in three qubits in the state zero and the one state in, in three qubits in the one state and again do this majority vote. But then what about correcting an, a phase error which flips the, the phase uh, between the zero plus one and the zero minus one? How can we correct also this error uh, in, in a code? In a, in a, so this kind of gives rise to these quantum error correction codes uh, that will be discuss, discussed by uh, Naomi Nickerson on Monday and on Tuesday. And, and uh, she'll tell us what is an error correction code, uh, what errors can be considered sufficiently small in order for us to build something called fault tolerance, meaning that uh, we can add uh, more and more complicated code and basically reduce the level of the error. And, and how do we actually design and optimize our error correcting codes given the architecture of our quantum computer? Uh, all right. Um, so the, the, the uh, next kind of theoretical concept that we'll discuss, will be discussed by Fernando Brandao, uh, is, is kind of a more uh, contemporary topic uh, that has to deal with the current devices that are available uh, um, that has, say, several tens of qubits, and their, their size and error rates um, make it impossible to apply any error correction code. So we kind of have to uh, live with a, a number of uh, uh, qubits that are uh, noisy, and maybe they, are, they could be somehow still useful. Uh, these devices are often called noisy intermediate uh, quantum devices, uh, or going by the name NIST, uh, noisy intermediate scale quantum devices. Uh, in, in these devices, uh, there's basically no error correction, and, and you can ask, what can we do with these devices? So there's several proposals for doing something interesting with these type of devices. One thing we could do is we try to uh, optimize quantum states. For example, we, we try to uh, prepare 
states on this quantum device and try to optimize them, for example, for minimizing the energy of some Hamiltonian. Um, so this is kind of one type of protocol that could be used uh, in the devices. Another protocol is what's called quantum supremacy, and this is what Adi alluded to in, in this uh, uh, news item, uh, where we uh, just want to uh, inspect the probability distribution that we get out of the device and see that they're kind of non-classical. Uh, and maybe to do quantum simulations of actual uh, quantum systems that have many, many qubits, which are not possible on a classical computer. So it's not clear yet where, where this, it's actually possible to, to do all of these things with these uh, noisy devices, but Fernando will discuss this at length uh, uh, during his uh, lecture. And now the, the next part or, or, uh, of the school kind of deals with the interface between quantum information uh, and many body physics. Uh, so, so we'll start with Dorit, Dorit Aronov, which will basically uh, discuss uh, kind of the computational power of Hamiltonian. If you think about the Hamiltonian, you can think about, the, uh, if you have, want to know what is the ground set of the Hamiltonian, you can think about the, finding the ground set of Hamiltonian is somehow a, a, a problem where you try to satisfy as many terms in the Hamiltonian and get as minimal energy as you can. So you can think about it, uh, an analogy with a classical uh, satisfiability problem where you try to satisfy a logical clause. And you want to minimize kind of the unhappy terms uh, in this sum. Now, uh, we know that finding the ground set of a Hamiltonian in a many-body quantum system is generically a, a very hard problem. It's exponentially hard, and everybody, anybody working on uh, condensed matter theory would, would tell you how hard it is. Uh, um, the question is, really, how hard is it uh, on a quantum computer? And in fact, if I give you, uh, um, you know, a, a, a quantum state, how can I actually check that it's indeed a ground set of Hamiltonian. So Dorit will discuss these classes of problems uh, on Wednesday and, and Thursday. Uh, and, and from Dorit, we'll move on to a more, even more kind of condensed matter uh, perspective. Uh, and uh, we'll basically uh, go on to looking at, at, at kind of quantum many body phases of matter and uh, how can we use tools from quantum information theory to actually analyze it. Uh, so, you know, the, the canonical question that uh, in condensed matter physics uh, we ask ourselves is uh, how do we, what is the, if you look at a system, what is the transport of charge, heat, and information in the system? How do we actually, for example, uh, if we look at charge, we, we think we kind of know how to quantify uh, charge transport uh, in a system. We can look at electrical current, etc. But how do we actually quantify uh, what in, uh, propagation of information, what quantity should we actually use to quantify uh, this type of propagation. Uh, and, and here I'm alluding to the fact that we want to use uh, entanglement properties of the, of the state, of the quantum state of the system, to quantify uh, this kind of uh, dynamics in propagation. Um, now, specifically, uh, Ehud uh, Altman and Shivaji Sondi, uh, we discussed the case of uh, basically uh, uh, the, the, the situation where we have uh, in insulators of heat and information in systems that are, are interacting in strongly disorder. And this goes to uh, a phase of matter we call many body localization. Those discuss the question does it really exist? In what dimension? What level of insulation can we actually get in this type of systems? Uh, and uh, they also discuss the contrast, the, uh, uh, on, in contrast, how does quantum information spread? in an ergodic many-body quantum system. So in contrast to these kind of uh, information insulators and heat insulators, we'll talk about information spread in a, in a fully ergodic uh, quantum system. Uh, so how to quantify, for example, the speed uh, of spreading of quantum information. Um, the next topic which we will cover is, is kind of a very, also a very uh, timely topic, is topics of non-equilibrium uh, quantum, system, quantum systems, uh, many body quantum systems. Uh, can we we'll discuss the question of uh, new phase of matter we can find in these systems and new types of phase transitions that we might find in the systems? Specifically, Eud and Chibadi and also Gil Rafael uh, will discuss uh, systems that are uh, driven by a time periodic uh, driving field. Um, now, in these type of systems, we, uh, we have a, a kind of an auxiliary. Uh, uh, theorem, which is called Floquet theorem, which is, is what 
Usually we, we know uh, about Bloch's theorem, which tells us what happens in a system which is periodic in space, but Floquet's theorem basically tells us what happens to a system which is periodic in time. Um, and this uh, gives us additional computational power. For example, we know that these type of systems have spectrum. We can discuss the eigenstates of the system, etc. Now, the main question we're worried about in these type of systems is uh, about whether the system will heat up as a result of the drive or not. Uh, and and uh, Gillen, Chivalgi, and Eldo discuss uh, basically a way to suppress this kind of heating using many body localization. And they will show you that you can actually get new, new uh, types of phase of matter uh, in the systems uh, in the presence of many body localizations. And this phase, one of these interesting phases goes by the name of time crystals, and I'll leave uh, stage of Shivaji to, to uh, discuss. Um, and moreover, you can even go beyond just a uh, periodically driven system and just describe very generic time evolution where you just have a circuit model and additional errors. And you want to know, and you want to look at the dynamics of the system uh, of this type kind of, uh, this kind of digital type of dynamic. Um, and finally, uh, we'll also discuss how can you uh, basically simulate quantum systems uh, using ideas from uh, quantum information theory. And now we will discuss uh, tensor networks as a tool for basically describing low entanglement quantum states and using them to simulate quantum systems. And in particular, he will show you that uh, despite the fact that the entropy growth in a, in a non-equilibrium quantum system is a function of time, you could still use these tensor networks in order to uh, have a classical simulation of the system. So this will be discussed by Gil on Thursday and then Friday. So uh, to, to wrap up, uh, so now that you know, the, the, the election results have been decisively settled and we know what's going to be the uh, policy of the Israeli government in the, in the near future, uh, we want to basically ask ourselves how do we position Israel uh, kind of in the front line of research in quantum science and technology. Uh, and we'll dis discuss this uh, at length in, in the panel discussion that we'll have tomorrow. Um, there's already a big quantum, Israeli quantum initiative that has been uh, put out by the Council of, Higher, uh, Council of Higher Education in Israel, and we are also thankful for them for uh, sponsoring this uh, conference. Um, and uh, yeah, but we would like to discuss kind of future plans and, and how to actually uh, pick up on that and, and you know, put us on the map. Uh, and you know, we don't know if there's going to be a third round election. Uh, but uh, if there will, remember that K got cook is for fun. Thank you very much. And enjoy the rest of the week.